My name is Yu Xiao. I am an associate professor in um, Tulane School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. And I really want to welcome everyone for being part of the uh, documentary screening and discussion today. And uh, today we have four panelists. Um, and actually, I, I would like to say that I actually invited uh, PSUCI directors to be on the panel but either they um, did not respond to my email or said no. So that's why I went ahead and with uh, the four panelists that I invited, uh, they were given a chance to come and talk, but nobody showed up. Um, okay, um, so we have uh, four panelists. Um, well, <laughs> of course we have the film um, director, Doris Liu. She flew all, over, uh, all the way from Canada here. And we also have uh, Dr. Jennifer Ruth. Uh, she's a professor in film studies at PSU. <laughs> and then Rachel Peterson. Um, she's the policy director of National Association of Scholars. <laughs> and we have um, Dorje Setem, and he's uh, executive director um, for the students for Free Tibet. Um, I, I think the panel will uh, go the following format. I will ask some leading questions and I'll lead the discussion. And then we'll open up for, um, to the floor for questions. So um, um, I would uh, like first um, ask Doris a question because the documentary that she filmed um, is about a Canadian case that took place a few years ago. And I know that she has been screening um, this documentary for over 90 times now in, over, uh, in 14 different countries. So I want her to uh, maybe give us some updates about some uh, international trend on the you know, like issues about the Confucius Institute. Okay, thank you for your question. And first of all, let me thank everyone uh, for coming to uh, the film screening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. Um, yes, today is the 91st time uh, my film has been public uh, screened. Um, the 14 countries, including uh, America, Canada, I will not. Uh, uh, Sweden, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Denmark, and, and Japan, so across four continents. Um, the audiences overwhelmingly um, praise the film that brings them uh, the information they haven't heard from, um, and the dis uh, issues discussed in this film um, they never thought of uh, could be that uh, severe or serious. So I would say um, uh, audiences who watched my film um, said the film uh, is an eye-opener. And among all those screenings, uh, including the screenings in the UK Parliament last June and the screenings in the Australian Parliament last July and the Danish Parliament just passed a week. I just came back from, uh, from Europe. Um, I personally, I am uh, very, feel very rewarding by doing this film. Uh, the UK uh, Conservative Party Human Rights Commission who hosted the premiere of my film in the Parliament just released uh, new report on the Confucius Institutes in the UK um, in, in last month. Yeah. They urged the UK government to look into this uh, issue and to stop forging any new partnership with the Hanban uh, in the UK and look into the existing um, 29 Confucius Institutes plus some 100 something Confucius classroom partnership in the UK. And in the Australia, the New South Wales state government, they started a review their own partnership with Hanban, which is unique because most of the partnership was forged by a foreign university or school board and Hanban. And that one was forged by a 
governments, uh, foreign governments. We had one in Canada too, a, a provincial, uh, Canadian provincial government forced one partnership with Hanban, but they just announced last month they will close that uh, Confucius Institute. That means they will not renew the par uh, agreement. So, I've, uh, of course, in the United States, it's uh, it's been leading the tied to counter back the Confucius Institutes. I will leave that to um, Rochelle, who is the ex uh, expert in that uh, front. front. Thank you. Well, my, my next question is actually for Rochelle, because she has studied over 10 uh, Confucius Institutes uh, in the US. So I um, would like to ask her for, uh, like, give us some information about her findings. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I did a report two years ago now called Outsourced to China, Confucius Institutes and Soft Power in American Higher Education. I did case studies at 12 universities with Confucius Institutes, and the findings are very similar to what you saw in the film here, where um, academic freedom is compromised. Um, teachers at Confucius Institutes do not have full freedom of speech. Um, the material that gets presented to students is one-sided, uh, usually in the form of leaving out important things, um, giving students an artificially rosy picture of what the Chinese government is like and what its policies entail. Since then, um, we've seen increasing interest in the United States in closing down Confucius Institutes. There are now 17 American universities that have decided to close their Confucius Institute. I hope Portland State University might be the 18th. Um, and really what we're seeing in the United States is uh, waking up to China's subtle aggression. And I say subtle because um, the Chinese government works in a way to try to build relationships, to encourage people to you know, have friendly feelings toward China. And one of the main um, priorities of the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Work Department is to make the foreign serve China, uh, develop these relationships so that foreign institutions whether that's higher education or other institutions, you know, have these connections and relationships that make them feel good towards China and want to promote its interests. And what do we see Zhu Lin, the uh, director of the Confucius Institute headquarters, say in this documentary, responding to Chinese criticism? While we're still having control over the Confucius Institutes, it's like the foreign universities work for us. That's what she said there in the, in the documentary. Um, so uh, we have seen four bills come out of Congress now relating to Confucius Institutes. Just last week, the Government Accountability Office released its own report on Confucius Institutes, and the Senate's Permanent Select Committee on Investigations did its own report as well, and the findings there are the same, where universities have not been able to have control over the curriculum, have not been able to ensure that the hiring process is free of discrimination, and have not been able to ensure that um, academic freedom has been respected. All right, um, next question for Dorje. Um, because I know that he, he was born in a Tibetan refugee camp in India, so I want to ask him from his point of view, like, you know, what Confucius Institute has been censoring, like what cannot be discussed, or like tr they try to suppress the discussion of. So, um, yeah, if you can talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Shayu, and uh, especially coordinating this uh, important event here. We are here because all of us are concerned and I hope after watching the film, you are also equally concerned. I want to acknowledge, uh, as uh, Shayu said, I was born in a Tibetan refugee camp. Uh, my family escaped Tibet in 1959 when China invaded my hometown. And uh, I was born in a refugee camp and I acknowledge there are other Tibetan in this room uh, who has faced similar tragedy. Uh, there are Tibetans from Tibet whose families are inside Tibet right now and they cannot contact them, they cannot go to Tibet because China systematically deny visa even to Tibetan Americans. And we, I, I came to know that we have uh, uh, members from Taiwanese community here, Falun Gong practitioner and Chinese community. So all of us are really concerned. And uh, we are heavy hearing the news because this coming March 10th is the 60th Tibetan National Uprising Day. 
and we are hearing news that inside Tibet, in Lhasa, uh, the travel has been banned. Uh, foreigners are, cannot go. There's a restrictions mounting in. And you might have also heard about the news of the critical news, what is happening inside Xinjiang, also known as East Turkestan. Uh, over one million uh, people are behind the concentration camp. And imagine, it is happening right now. Families are missing, uh, children are missing, and it is happening in, under the Chinese communist regime, under the Xi Jinping's rule. And uh, the, the person who has uh, implemented this policy, uh, especially uh, Chen, Go, Chen Guenggo, the current Communist Party secretary of the Xinjiang, uh, of the Xinjiang Autonomous uh, Region, Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, who is particularly responsible for this gross violation of human rights, uh, was also responsible for similar atrocity in Tibet when he was the, then the party secretary in Tibet. Uh, as soon as he became the party secretary, he had uh, repressed religious freedom in Tibet, implementing a new security policy which divided urban centers into grids, giving authorities the means to systematically surveil all activities within the areas, and instituting new biometric identification cards. So these are all happening inside Tibet, inside uh, the, to the Uyghur people. And in China, you, you also know that the, how people are being suppressed uh, for the democracy and for freedom. So we are concerned that these stories, these informations are now being censored in the free world, in the United States. Uh, we have report that our members from Students for Free Tibet are told that you cannot discuss and panels that also express how these issues are being censored here. Uh, in 2009, His Holiness Dalai Lama uh, talk at the NC State was banned, uh, and that was because of the advice from the uh, Confucius Institute in the, in, the, in the college, in the university. And you can understand someone like His Holiness, who is respected as a leader for peace and compassion, are being like stopped in the, in the, in, uh, to, to, to share the uh, concern and to share the message to the international community. So because of those uh, censorship, as uh, uh, speak, former speaker mentioned, that how now the, the Confucius Institute is being shut down in universities, uh, the coalition of the human rights uh, advocate and community members in Portland has written to the president of the PSU. Uh, we haven't had the reply. It's been almost like a month. And uh, there will be a lot of like, uh, uh, follow-up uh, discussion on that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, and then, um, you know, like the issue of PSUCI. So um, we know that uh, PSUCI, it was established in 2007. Um, and then uh, it helped establish 32 Confucius classrooms in local K-12 schools, um, you know, like in Oregon. Um, and then, um, you know, I want to um, ask Jennifer <laughs> to offer us some um, information about uh, what has been going on with uh, the, the PSUCI and uh, contract renewal and things uh, like that uh, from the PSU side. Okay, so hi, I'm Jennifer Ruth and um, I'm professor of film, but I'm here more because I sit on committee A for the National Organization of American Association of University Professors. So um, one of the things, so I'm, I'll, I will answer your question, you shall, about what's happening here in a second, but let me give a little bit of context, which is one of the things that makes this, this issue so particularly tricky at this moment is that many of us are not particularly proud of our government at this moment, and our government is xenophobic and is anti-immigrant and stuff. So, but in 2014, so five years ago, National AAUP looked at this, so right bef well before the Trump era, National AAUP looked at this and recommended that universities terminate their association unless universities can have more control over the hiring process and over and making and ensure that academic freedom isn't compromised on American soil, right? So that was in 2014. And one of the things I want to mention too is that uh, Rochelle, I think you would be open in saying that your organization is more associated with conservatism. Cons We're nonpartisan, but we've been labeled 
okay, we're nonpartisan and we get labeled liberal left, the, the AAUP. So AAUP is the, faculty, the national faculty organization that's uh, associated with liberal left, and Rochelle's organization is associated with conservative. This is a bipartisan issue, or a nonpartisan issue. Both Republicans and Democrats have issues with the Confucius state. I would also just want to mention, and, and I know that I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence here, there's so many different varying levels of knowledge about this issue or understanding about this issue. So. You, each of you might be coming from such a total different place, so this may be so obvious to you, but it's also certainly not about communism versus capitalism, right? It's about a one-party state that doesn't allow for toleration of minorities, religious freedom, academic freedom, intellectual freedom, et cetera. And we're not a one-party state, thank God, as of yet here in America. And the difference between, so for example, I've done two Fulbrights in China. When I did Fulbrights in China, I am left, and I would tell the Chinese students how much I hated George Bush all the time. They cannot say that they hate Xi Jinping when they come here, right? There's a fundamental difference. And the question, be, the other thing that I want to just mention, because I think it's a sticking point for a lot of people, is if we say no to one country, we're not saying, by the way, we're not saying no to one country. But that's the way it gets sort of reduced, right? It gets turned into, if we say no to one country, we're going to have to say no to our collaborations with every authoritarian state or every state that has any kind of human rights issues. That's not the issue here. We have a Middle East Studies Center on PSU campus. It's run entirely by a PSU professor who has control over the decisions the program makes, what kinds of um, funding channels work, what, what students apply to. Confucius Institute is not that. We have scholars of China uh, in the PSU, we could have, and we have an Institute of Asian Studies. It's not beholden to Hanban in any way, and it's not run by Hanban. It's run by our own experts, some of whom may have been, you know, born and raised elsewhere, and are permanent residents or citizens now, whatever. So it's it's a question of how it's organized and how much control different groups have, and whether academic freedom is possible. Okay, so PSU AUP. I'm the vice president of academic and free freedom and grievances for our local Portland State Union. And we supported a Senate resolution that was just passed. Um, the Senate resolution that was passed followed the national My Umbrella Organization, AUP's recommendation, which asked for universities to not renew contracts unless control over hiring and academic freedom was ensured. So the faculty senate, so there's sort of two different kinds of bodies. The union body, which represents academic professionals and faculty, and the faculty senate, which also, it's non-union, but it's PSU's faculty senate that represents faculty and, and academic professionals. So the union supported the senate to pass this resolution, and the resolution did pass. And right now, the administration is in, con in negotiations with Hanban over changing the contract language. Um, and things are pending right now. I have very deep concerns, and I speak just for myself here, because PSU AUP, we have to support the Senate process all the way through and not second guess it ahead of time, right? It's, it's still ongoing. We don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't want, I don't want to assume that Senate is not gonna do due diligence. I don't wanna assume that. Nonetheless, if you don't know a lot about this, if you haven't seen Doris's film, um, if you have language that says, sure, the instructors can have academic freedom, but you don't have language that says, okay, but we're gonna control the hiring, we're gonna have an actual person who's, they may be of Chinese descent, but they're American citizens or whatever, and they're academics, and they're, they're, they're specifically in this area, as opposed to just happen to be from China and thus have a kind of patriotism to China, right? There's a difference for a university. Confucius Institutes can be standalone things that teach Chinese language. It's a different thing when you say it's a university thing, affiliated with the university having academic kind of status. It needs to be handled differently. Um, so it's pending right now. We'll see. I'm not very hopeful from the conversations I've had with the provost, with the current director of the Confucius Institute. They've been very hostile from the beginning, very defensive, um, but we'll see where it goes. Yeah, and I want to also add a few things about from my observation. So um, in an article in the Inside Higher Ed um, in uh, July last year, um, it, it disclosed that um, our uh, CS, uh, PSU CI director was actually cited as an exemplary case of implementing all this censorship on university campus 
because the, our CI director said that we cannot organize uh, like discussions about Tiananmen Square. I mean, they, they said uh, they don't even say it's a massacre, although we know it is, it was, right? So um, anyway, so Tiananmen Square discussions and the Falun Gong discussion, they, they don't want to organize because these are the topics uh, that the Hanban or the Chinese regime does not want us to talk about. So she was um, you know, cited on inside the higher ed as an exemplary case because uh, it, it said in the article that uh, typically it's just self-censorship, but uh, we have an exemplary case, which is our PSUCI. Um, and, and also, um, I did a, a little bit of probing uh, because I think the religious persecution issue in China is really severe, and we need some discussion about it. So I asked the PSUCI to sponsor an event like that. Um, it was uh, last December, and um, the response was, well, we have to put it on agenda for like, every time, if you want to host any events, it has to be approved by Hanban, which means that, you know, like Hanban, the communist regime, they have to prove the events. Otherwise, the PSUCI cannot, um, you know, sponsor or provide money for that. Then a follow-up email to them, I said, look, I'm just asking you to advertise, right? So I'm not even asking you for money, but you have the CI, maybe an email list or something, you can be listed as a sponsor and you can send it through the email to promote this event, but there was no response from the CI. So um, from my point of view, you know, I don't see that um, the censorship, you know, like the censorship inside the higher ed article, that was uh, a communication with PSUCI in 2011. So, um, and my experiment really was last December. So I don't think that the censorship at PSU, you know, through the CI has stopped. And I don't think I have any reason to believe it will stop after the contract renewal. So that's, that's why, you know, I, I feel really it is important to have this discussion today. Um, because, uh, you know, these are the real concerns and issues. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, I think we should all think about it. And um, be, between money and, you know, fundamental values, what do we make the choice? Right, so you have to choose one, which one do you pick? Um, and I have one last question, then I'm going to open it to the floor. Um, you know, like I know that um, many other countries also have um, language, you know, promote their own culture. So for example, in UK, there's British Council, and um, there, in France, our um, alliances, Fran, uh, Francis. So those are uh, also, um, you know, cultural exchange um, programs, uh, but why is the Chinese government, you know, Confucius Institute gets all this um, criticism? Why not the others? Oh, well, you know, go yeah. ahead. Okay, so um, I think a lot of people, when they don't know much about the Confucius Institutes, they use to, they often confuse Confucius Institutes as the same thing as Alliance Frances, Gotti Institute, or British Council, but in fact, they are not. They are t fundamentally different in two ways. One, the other language and cultural promotional institutions are independent from their governments. Although their own governments found, provide funding to them, but they run, operate, uh, they have total uh, control of how they operate its institution. But the Confucius Institutes is 100% controlled and funded by the Chinese government. I just, uh, according to the bylaws and constitutions of the Confucius Institute's headquarters in Beijing, the, you know Hanban is under education ministry. Hanban oversees each and every Confucius Institute and Confucius classroom, but above Hanban, there is a council. And the chair of the council is a current uh, vice premier of the People's Re uh, Republic of China, which I was call PRC. And she's also the current uh, member of Politburo of the C Chinese Communist Party, which I will call CCP. So she is the top 25 guys in China in CCP. And she was also a former chair of the United Front Work Department, which you, Rochelle mentioned. And that organization is verified and, um, and then seen by the intelligence community across the world as the spying agency of the CCP. And so 
that under the chair, there are a few vice chair, plus some more than 10 executive members sit in that council. All those members are either high-ranking officials of various departments of the PRC or the high-ranking directors of the CCP, including education, foreign affairs, finance, um, information control, you know, the internet control and publication in CCTV and the United Front. So it's a cross-governmental, cross-departments uh, um, efforts trying to control everything happening in the CI and CC. And that council gives directives to Hanban, which through Hanban to implement in each and every CC and CI. So that's number one. Number two, um, the model for CI, as you see, it has to be hosted by a foreign university or a foreign school board. And even within the foreign universities, the CIs or CC, they are not stand-alone or institution. They have to be hosted by a department or a school in that university. And this model is totally different than the other organizations just named. Those are stand-alone. They have their own premises. They either own or rent a property in foreign country. But CIs doesn't own any property. They are actually strategically being seeded or attached or embedded to a foreign education institution. And you, I guess you know, understand what the purpose for the Chinese government to choose this model, which is to exert influence from the within, from within a foreign education system. So this is a very smart model. Before the Chinese government invented the CI initiative, they had studied all the other foreign um, language and culture promotional institutions already. So they purposefully chose or invented, invented this model. Um, and we have seen there have been no shortages of the examples of CIs or CC, they censor certain topics. The um, the host universities or schools, they oftentimes they do self censor as well. And in their textbooks, there are a lot of um, propagandistic uh, elements in in that. So and, and it's not only in U United States; it's in Canada. It happened in Canada, Australia. You know. Uh, many other countries, so it's not uh, isolated or individual cases. So that's why I think uh, the C CIs got criticisms or uh, concerns all the time. All right, we'll just open it up for questions from the floor. Sorry, can you to speak to, to the... No power to influence on this Chinese decision at all. Excuse me, can you speak to your microphone? Yeah, because uh, we are doing the live uh, recording. Yeah. Oh, okay. so this. Uh, just okay. speak to the... My question is yeah. that um, while watching the, the film and listening to you, I don't really hear any control exerted on this Chinese policy by counterpart, like in this case, PSU or the, the university in Canada. How come? Why are we so weak? Why are we so weak against Chinese policy? Money. Yes. <laughs> because we can then have free Chinese, from the university standpoint, Mandarin language classes that we don't have to pay for. We can have materials that we don't have to pay for. Our students can apply for travel. This is, I mean, this is a hard one, right? I mean, the, I, I want our students to be able to travel as much as possible, but it's money. And the problem is that administrators tell themselves, the minute I think there's a problem with censorship, you know, we can't become reliant on the money. But as you saw in the film, someone says something like, once the money's there, it's extremely hard to take it away. And that's the reality. And just to emphasize, you know, the amount of money, uh, this, this Senate report that just came out last week found that 
China has spent $158 million on Confucius Institutes in the United States. That's a lot of money, especially at liberal arts programs where $100,000 is a it can make a big difference, especially at small colleges and universities. And for universities, it's not just you know funding to be able to teach these classes, but then also if they're offering these classes for credit, as many Confucius Institutes do, then students are also paying tuition for classes that cost the university nothing. Um, and that funding is, you know, it makes a big deal. Um, as far as universities trying to exert control, another thing that came out of this Senate study is um, universities trying to push back on some of the restrictive um, requirements that Hanbon puts out, and, and Hanbon shut them down, said, no, we will not sign this amended contract. I'll be really interested to see what happens with right. Portland State University. Um, maybe Hanbon has gotten so much bad press that they figure we've got to amend it somehow just to keep it open. But, you know, I, I think um, there really is no safe way to operate a Confucius Institute. There is no safe way to put in enough safeguards to ensure that the influence is not going to be there. Um, the kinds of problems that we're pointing to with universities not having full control of the hiring procedures, accepting these textbooks printed by the Chinese government, accepting this funding, I, I consider each of those symptoms of the problem and not the primary problem itself. There's symptoms of the problem in which China is trying to, again, make the foreign serve China, make foreign institutions um, be influenced by the Chinese government's efforts. And so you can put in as many parchment barriers and paper requirements saying academic freedom will be fully respected here, um, but I am not confident that China would actually respect those agreements, and my concern is that the university in putting that language in is just giving itself a safeguard, something to point to on paper and say, whatever happens with Confucius Institutes elsewhere, well here at least on paper we have this policy saying we are not guilty, we are not complicit in any of that, even if the same problems still remain. Right, just as the, uh, the, the, the guy I interviewed in the, in the, in the film, just give you a, one, uh, number about how the Chinese government has been spending on the CI across the world. It's more than two billion, more than two billion. And, then, and the real number should be larger than that because uh, there is lack of number for the first two years and the last year. Um, there's no uh, budget spent, uh, I mean, no uh, public uh, number to show how much the Ch uh, Chinese government have been spending on this. So, but two billion, more, more than two billion. Yeah, I think to that question, one thing that need to understand is uh, the awareness on this issue is lacking. And I commend Doris, this film, which is really exposing uh, what Confucius Institute is doing. I met a lot of like leaders, elected leaders. When we speak about this concern, they don't know. And these contracts are signed secretly. And there's a clause that they cannot reveal the contract to people. And of course, as a, if you are a student or a member of the PSU, you can ask uh, your authority to, about the you know, clause. And in clause, it mentioned about respecting the law of Chinese government. And we know that Chinese government right now, anything against freedom or like the, the persecution of the religious community, uh, and they're trying to implement here in that way. And also, just to add on, like I really commend the faculty senate concern uh, and the, the people that are like you know raising this issue, uh, and also about the the contract. Uh, we know that the and, and other speakers have mentioned as well. Senior Communist Party officials such as Li Chengchu, former Politburo Standing Committee member, and CCP China's propaganda chief from 2002 to 12. And she said that, and quote, Confucius Institute is an important part of China's overseas propaganda setup. And when we speak here, like as a Tibetan, I, I really value and respect Chinese culture, Chinese language, and of course we need to learn it, and there's no, there's no second thought on that. But they bring those like, you know, censorship here, and as a Tibetan community, we are concerned because we, we face a lot of tragedy in our country, and the operation and repression is happening right now, as I explained before. And now, these discussions are being censored here, and I think that is concerning as well. So, yeah, so I feel like, 
as I also uh, agree on the other speakers, like, you know, uh, no matter what amend we do in the contract, it's gonna be very difficult. The whole setup itself, there's a false, and we need to really rethink again. And as other universities are uh, stepping in, it is time to end the contract and then also have another space how we can teach Chinese language and culture in the United States. Hey, so um, in the documentary, I saw it uh, like during lots, lots of the footage about the protests and counter protests um, regarding the CIs. I saw like a, a lot of the people, like a lot of the Chinese apparently maybe Chinese students or like Chinese American or like chi overseas Chinese um, like waving Chinese flags and like uh, yelling and stuff so like and also there was that or there was that lady from the Confucius Institute or no sorry from the from the overseas Chinese Association and she said or it was like I forgot if it was her but it was in the it was in her orders to like from the from the from the Chinese regime saying that she had that they had to organize parades to whenever uh, China's interests were, were being affected, or were so-called China's interests, actually the, the party's interests, were being um, uh, threatened. So, like, have, so, so it seems like this kind of um, this kind of like mobilization of uh, overseas Chinese and Chinese stu international students is pretty common. Has that happened here? And is that and also do you, how, how does that fit into the into the broader mission of the CIs? Yeah. Right. Thanks for the question. Um, as you saw in. I think um, on the campus, foreign uh, university campus, along with Confucius Institutes, which is a major software, soft power tool used by the PRC, there's another organization named Chinese Students and Scholarship Scholar Association, in short, CSSA. That's another organization. I believe each and every foreign university has that uh, organization, and that organization, by and large, listens to local Chinese consulate or embassy, and it's also receive funding from the Chinese consulate and embassy. Um, for example, just last month in University of Toronto, which is the top three university in Canada, the Chinese uh, students in that university protest the newly elected um, chair of the student union, who happens to be a Tibetan girl. And the Chinese students, through that organization, and uh, invented an online petition and uh, kind of bullying online, and request that new chair to be resigned or to be uh, you know, removed from the post, just because she is pro-Tibet independence. And right now, the Toronto police is investigating this online bully and trying to find out if the Chinese government does uh, hide behind that Chinese students. And similar things happening in another Canadian university as well. But in America, I know in February 2017, I believe so, in University of Cal UC San Diego, UC San Diego in the West, um, there was um, uh, the Holalist Dalai Lama was invited to speak on campus by the Chinese students again through that CSSA organization, protest that decision uh, of the university, and I believe eventually the uh, speak was cancelled. Was cancelled? No, 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 not he was cancelled. Did speak, but under immense protests. Yeah, immense protest. That's uh, there's some other examples as well. In so, uh, I think uh, the foreign university is not safe. While we are ex uh, welcoming more and more Chinese students coming in, which in a way is good because inside China is heavily controlled and internet was policed and blocked. Chinese people are have facing huge challenge access and free information. So sending Chinese people or tourists or whoever Chinese from mainland to outside of mainland, which will uh, provide those Chinese people are opportunity to be opened, ex exposed to free information. Uh, that's a good side, but the downside uh, would be the Chinese 
people like myself, I was born and grown up in China, and I had my education in China, uh, university education in China. So chi the propaganda and brainwashing is a day, it's on a daily basis. It's, it, it's part of our life, just tell you. If here a kid singing a kid song, and then in China we say, we sing those red song, praising the Communist Party or praising the Chinese government, that's part of our life. And you, you, there's no way you escape from that. So my point is the downside with more and more Chinese population pouring to the foreign um, countries would be the brainwashed Chinese, um, like you saw in my film, who came out to support the Confucius Institutes in, in Toronto, would bring the propaganda with them, and they themselves, many of them, themselves are, are leaving propaganda. They don't, they don't know that. They don't know that until one day they, they, they suddenly wake up. Uh, but it's not all of all Chinese like that. Please just make a distinction, like myself and, and many others, uh, who do understand the um, the cruelty, suppressive nature of the Chinese government. They do fight against. So I just want to say something first of all about um, how much I admire Doris and Yu Xiao because it's not as if there aren't repercussions for them. I mean, one thing you may ask yourself is. If there's all these problems, why are we having um, certain people who have certain issues representing and not just academics? But there are, one of the things you have to understand is that academics self-censor, because if you're involved in China studies in any way, it's a very uneven playing field in terms of the CCP's so total control over information and who comes in and out of the country versus the way we operate in a two-party state. Um, that has to have a certain element of nonpartisanship in, in relationship nation state to nation state. China doesn't have to have that. So our chi scholars on China, whether they're of Chinese descent or not, right, they have to think twice before they talk about any of these issues because they might not get a visa to go back to China and do their research. And then the very thing that they work to get a PhD for and to write their books about, they're blocked from doing. And that's a really real thing. And it's part of why you're not hearing as much from scholars on China about this as you might otherwise think you should be. Right. Uh, yes, I just have uh, two questions. One for Ms. Liu. Um, I think it was mentioned in your documentary that they said that Dalai Lama was a demon. Was that actually in the written materials? Um, I'm aware that this is the 60th anniversary since the Dalai Lama left his country and lives in exile in India. Um, perhaps you could touch on the three T's, uh, Taiwan, Tibet, and Tiananmen Square massacre, that these are like three topics that are avoided. And then for uh, Ms. Ruth, um, do we know what the current budget is for the Confucius Institute here at PSU, and is the current contract between Han Bon and Portland State University available online? I did not see it on the PSU website. Thank you for your question. I believe that was, um, uh, you, you saw that was a Chinese Canadian parent, right, who was uh, asking question to the former chair of the board. I believe she wanted to say Dalai Lama was portrayed as a demon, uh, but uh, to my experiences, I never saw in Chinese textbooks to say Dalai Lama was a demon, but rather than saying Dalai Lama was a separate, separatist. Yeah, so I think, that, you know, English is her second language, just like English my second language, so in that circumstances, she chose the, uh, I, I believe, chose the wrong word, but um, yeah. But aren't separatists almost um, equivalent to terrorists in the language that the CCP uses? So if you're a separatist, it's not that you are advocating for different kind of political organization, it's that you're a terrorist. Um, so those are really good questions, and um, I have seen the budget. I can't quote it offhand. I should have come more prepared. The budget, how much money we get from Confucius Institute. Hanban rents are a lot of space in the Carl Miller Center. So we get some money through that as well as the free classes. PSU wants to, the administration wants to draw a very hard distinction between 
uh, the fact that we do not at PSU allow for credit bearing classes paid for through Hanban and the Confucius Institute, only non-credit bearing. My, um, my issue with that though is that is an issue of academic freedom and academic integrity. If you're affiliated, and I agree with your, the concerns that ha there's no safety controls for operating a Confucius Institute at a university, it would have to ultimately turn into money with no strings attached, run entirely by uh, professors and scholars uh, and experts hired th by ourselves, and it would turn into something that could look at the Uyghur concentration camps as easily as it could look at the history of calligraphy, and that is not the situation now. We can talk about calligraphy all we want, we can't talk about the Uyghurs with the Confucius Institute. So it would have to turn into something that I don't think the party would be comfortable with, period. Um, the way that we approached it at PSU, first of all, I'm not faculty senate, I'm union. So union recommended this resolution, senate has passed it, I can't speak for senate. Um, but I do know that there's such varying degrees of knowledge about this, that to come out of the gate, especially in this truly xenophobic moment in American culture with Trump to come out of the gate saying um, we want to terminate the Confucius Institutes would have been a non-starter. It would have been seen, all of the complexity of these issues wouldn't get digested. So even though there may be something naive about hoping to renegotiate, I don't see strategically that we had any other option for pursuing opening up this conversation. Is the contract available online? No. They, but that's one of the stipulations of the resolution, is that it be made available. Thank you. I forgot about that. I, I want to um, answer uh, another part of your question about the Tiananmen Square massacre. Because I also, like Doris Liu, I grew up in China. I was told, um, it happened when I was in elementary school, and I was told nobody died on Tiananmen Square. And I believed that for 10 years until I went to uh, Peking University where that, that was a headquarter for the student protesters, then it's like urban legend, right? So like people told me, okay, that's the building that we had this uh, Tiananmen protest. And I'm like, did anyone die? Yes, of course people die. Then I realized I've been cheated for 10 years, right? And then I went to talk to the PSUCI director, the Chinese side the director, and I asked him, so do you know anyone died? <laughs> during the 1989 you know, Tiananmen Square um, thing. And then he, he said, well, we don't have any evidence or we don't know whether anyone died because we have not seen evidence of that. That's from the CI, PSU CI director. And uh, I'm like, you know, that's unacceptable. And uh, I have been cheated for 10 years and he's still sowing the seed of doubt in people's mind here on PSU campus, and I totally <laughs> cannot accept that. Okay, any other question? Okay. So I believe that the former director of the, was at the school board, he called the, the mother coming to him um, like xenophobic or said that the beliefs were xenophobic. And I thought that was very interesting because um, from what was portrayed, the institute is not wanting to share more on other like groups and um, practices and really allow that information to be shared. So I'm wondering if the people kind of saying that those who oppose the institute are like xenophobic or anti-Chinese culture and language, if they actually believe that or if they are again motivated by money and if the director was possibly found of like receiving any sort of like compensation or money or personal benefit. Um, for wanting to bring the Institute to Toronto. I think xenophobia or racism or anti-China are the very convenient labels used by the Chinese government to, to put to anyone who is critical to the government or to the CCP regime. So some Westerners who are very close to the PRC or CCP uh, would like to use those labels to put on anyone who is critical. Like, I myself is a Chinese, how could I be racist to Chinese culture? I love people to learn my home language and culture. Um, so I think that's um, my advantage to standing out, to speaking out on this issue as a Chinese myself. So I have, I, have, I have a question, but I also wanted to point out that I do think that there was, well, you talked about the xenophobia during this era of Trump, right? Um, there was a couple, even though um, you can't blame it all on xenophobia wanting to shut down the, the 
um, Confucius Institutes, right? Some of the protesters there, the costumes they were wearing and the signs they were showing were absolutely xenophobic. Um, so a lot of the, like, there were the guys that were like the extermination suits with the gas masks and stuff. I mean, that sends a signal that like we're exterminating people, isn't it? I mean, some of the, I feel like some of the, the, the visual and the language involved in the, from the protesters was in a large way xenophobic. Um, so I don't, I guess I was wondering what, what's the, the impact of this. I mean, we can talk about it on the college campus, talk about the, I guess everybody in this room might have a, a, an understanding of why we would, why we don't want to Confucius Institute and in, in say at PSU. But when you get the mob mentality at a protest like that, and you get tons of people involved that might not have the, the, the backing, the understanding for why they're doing it, then at a certain point it does kind of, I think it does kind of flame xenophobia. Um, but then my question would be, where can I find like resources? Um, like I was looking up on here, what elementary schools in Portland have um, classes. How can I acquire like a textbook? And so I could look through it and actually see what are they teaching kids in those classes. Is there a place I can get those resources? That's hard. I did case studies at, at 12 Confucius Institutes, and um, none of them would let me take home a textbook and have it. Um, I mean, I think all you can do is ask. Doris, did you successfully take home a textbook? At a very early stage, when I just visited one of the uh, Confucius Institutes, which is very close to Toronto, I pretend, I brought a uh, Canadian, like a black guy with me and pretend uh, my friend is in, was interested in learning Chinese, so the uh, CI staff uh, allowed us to bring a couple materials back home, yeah. But uh, I will let you, I will tell, I will say uh, not each and every uh, Hanban textbook contains a propaganda in it, but you, there certainly have the propaganda materials in the books, but not each and everyone uh, has that. And, and also, sorry, I just I wanted to add up to the xenophobia thing. Uh, the protesters are, I believe they were uh, Tibetan people, the youth, and in their eyes, they thought the Confucius Institutes was like cancer or like poison. Like they're poison people with the propaganda, with censorship, all the uh, anti-universal value things. So that's in their eye. They're not targeting China. They're not targeting Chinese culture. They're targeting the Chinese government. So I think when we talk about China, I know it's for sure, it's convenient, use China. But we do need to make very uh, clear distinction between China as country, as nation, as people, Chinese people, as culture, and the Chinese government, and the Chinese Communist Party, because that's the tricky thing that the PRC and uh, CCP has been brainwashing people to believe all those concepts are one, China. If you criticize the C PRC or Chinese government or the CCP, you criticize China. That's the purpose, uh, purposeful brainwash. You could also just ask PPS if you could have access to some of those materials. I think one other issue to bring up as far as it being in our schools is even if the material, even if you were to look at the material and say, well, I don't see anything anti-American or, or, or pro-communism here. Um, one thing to also consider that I, I think about a lot is how many of our permanent residents and Chinese Americans who have the skills to teach Chinese are not being hired by our own school districts because we're getting this free influx of labor. Whenever you have free labor, it throws off the whole labor market. And I know people who have moved here and who are taking jobs, who are school teachers in China, who are taking jobs quite beneath them because we have such draconian um, rules about getting certificates or prof professional credentials to teach in our district. But we let the Confucius Institute, because it's free, come and without any of those rules. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sylvia, and I'm a board member of FAPA, which is foremost an association for public affairs. So actually in October, uh, just before my question, I'm just gonna quickly share like before, uh, uh, so in October last year, we had the opportunity to brief with Congresswoman Bonamici with our concerns uh, of CU, uh, CI, sorry, Confucius Institute. And um, our briefing was mainly based on this state research report by 
U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. And the title of this report, uh, if anyone's interested, it's an open public report you can find online. The title of this report is China's Overseas United Framework. It's very, very interesting. Even for me as the Taiwanese, you know, it's, it's eye-opening. So I encourage you to look at online if you're interested in more about the United uh, Front Work in China. Um, so my question is, um, where do we stand here in Oregon um, in regard of our concerns with um, CI in PSU? There's actually another one in uh, the University of Oregon or Oregon State University. There's two uh, CI in, our, in the university here in Oregon. Like, where do we stand here in Oregon? What can we do to take actions to uh, either um, end the relationship with CI or at least to make them to make dramatic changes to allow academ academic freedom and speech freedom? What can we do um, in Oregon to change the situation here? Thank you. I guess it's maybe the only parent of kids in PPS, and my children went, both my daughters went through the Mandarin Immersion Program that was started very, very early by the State Department, and the difference is the State Department hires uh, citizens, uh, some of whom are very, very pro-China, pro-CCP, you know, they live here, but they were grow up in China, some of whom aren't, right? You have the same range, because there can't be any kind of discrimination or political questions about political affiliations when uh, the school, when the, our district hires people, right? So anyway, our, my kids went through Mandarin Immersion, and what we can do, we can definitely lobby PPS, because actually I think that's a little bit, that's, we have a lot of Confucius classrooms through PPS. Um, Taiwanese parents, cause, and of course every country, is, some Taiwanese are pro-China, some are, are really freaked out by what's going on. So, but the ones who are freaked out, get them to mobilize and lobby, uh, and the Tibetans and Muslims who know what's going on in Xinjiang, to lobby PPS because it's heartbreaking to think that you're a parent who came here and were persecuted in China and now your kid's in the public school in America and is not being allowed to hear all the realities. I think awareness, awareness, the, uh, the very important first step to know the truth and uh, tell, share with people about what you learn, uh, know about the issue and uh, mobilize more people and then eventually you can take action to uh, do some plan some technical uh, strategies to do things like you yeah suggested i think we have time for one last question um so my question is actually about falun gong in the documentary um and i've looked into falun gong a little bit before um and uh so when you're talking about like religious discrimination i've heard falun gong be defined in different ways. So would you define Falun Gong as a religion? Would you define it as a um, spiritual ideology? And what would you say are the ideologies and the uh, belief systems within Falun Gong um, in like a very like plain unbiased language? Um. <laughs> Yes, of course, because the uh, main character in my film practiced Falun Gong as well as her mother, who is still under um, very close watch by the Chinese authorities and who cannot get a passport. Um, I studied Falun Gong and I did some research and based on my research and, and my personal understanding, I think Falun Gong is rooted deeply in the traditional Chinese culture and philosophy. Because uh, throughout 5,000 years of China's culture, uh, history, uh, it's, been, um, it's been a culture and history of self-improvement and cultivation. And Falun Gong is very in line with that philosophy. And the principles of Falun Gong is truthfulness and compassion forbearance, which are very good. I would bet everyone will agree with that. Um, but unfortunately, uh, since 1999, uh, the movement, Falun Gong movement, has been under um, severe persecution by the PRC and the CCP. And I believe, that just from the, based on the number of people uh, who practice Falun Gong and who are under this per uh, persecution, I would, 
I would believe the Falun Gong group would be the number one targeted and persecuted uh, group, community, in mainland China. And uh, a lot of horrible things and unbelievable things happening to this uh, group. Um, for example, uh, Sonia's mother was put into jail for two years and almost lost her lives and just for practice truthfulness, compassion for parents, which uh, to me it sounds really good. And uh, some other people, I believe as, as many as tens of thousands, if not million, uh, Falun Gong followers or practitioners are uh, persecuted to death. And some are uh, died from live organ harvesting, which is hard to believe. Which means when the practitioners still alive, uh, his or her organs are taken away by Chinese doctors and sell for wealthy people, Chinese or foreigners, who can afford that price to make profit. Um, An independent European Commission found that there was evidence of that. There was enough, there's rumors about it and everything, and then so an independent group that had no affiliation looked into it and said, yes, this is true. Right, because I'm, I'm a Canadian already, and uh, the independent investigation into this organ harvesting, like forced live organ harvesting allegations, was actually done by two individual Canadians. One was a third, like long time serving of members of parliament, who himself was a prosecutor. Another uh, investigator was um, uh, is an international human rights uh, lawyer, and both investigators was, were nominated for a, peace, a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I personally believe all those investigations, and I believe the real situation would be even worse than that. Like, I taught at a Chinese university before I immigrated to, Can uh, to Canada. I heard, while I was in China, I heard, I don't know them personally, but I heard a teacher in uh, English literacy um, department or school who practiced Falun Gong were, were first, um, monitored and then uh, removed from her teaching post, which means lost in income. And eventually she was tortured and injected, uh, you know, the uh, medicine, which will destroy her, um, her uh, nerve system or immune system. So she became kind of uh, insane or something. And another case was a, a professor and who, is an expert in environment who gets uh, award by the Chinese government as well. She practices Falun Gong and she was put into jail. That's the two people I heard of that happened in my university where I taught. And uh, of course, um, while I was in the university, uh, the persecution against the Falun Gong happened and we as teachers in the university were all um, notified and uh, requested, I would say requested by the authority to keep an eye on your own student or faculty members and report to the um, university authority whoever practices Falun Gong. And I, I know some uh, graduate or postgraduate students were just uh, couldn't finish their study, not because they are poor, in academic uh, study, but because they practice Falun Gong. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, to answer your question, I, I think Falun Gong, if you think, discuss from the Western standard, it could be seen as a religion, but if you look at this movement from the Eastern or Chinese angle perspective, it's it's, it's not a typical uh, religion because it doesn't have any um, ritual to worship or organize or, or name list. It's very, very freestyle, I would say. There's no organization among this community. And it's everything, everyone is just coming to study or practice uh, if you wish. If you don't want to, you just leave. No one knows you even. Uh, okay, so I would like to add on the question about what we can do. Uh, I think it will be really uh, helpful, and I 
as I commend Professor for taking this initiative. Uh, and mentioned before, there is a coalition of Tibetan, uh, Chinese, Taiwanese, uh, Uyghurs members, uh, everyone together who are concerned uh, petitioning to the administration. Uh, a Tibetan student actually uh, started an online petition uh, recently, and I think over a thousand, almost like a thousand people already signed in, uh, asking the Board of Trustees to you know, consider this uh, important issue and concerning our, 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 our raising our concern. And uh, I think every one of you here, especially who are part of PSU family, you can also directly write to your administration and raise your concern. And, uh, and some of the question that was raised uh, before uh, regarding His Holiness Dalai Lama, uh, like how Chinese uh, communist regime tag him and uh, in, in a very disrespectful, which uh, every Tibetan inside and outside, uh, we feel so pain when such things are being said. Uh, and as, as we know that His Holiness has been s s sending the message of peace and nonviolence throughout the you know, 60 years of uh, occupation of Tibet, he was the one who guided us believing in nonviolence uh, you know, fighting for our rights and be hopeful that justice will prevail. And, uh, and that's why he is respected globally, uh, but, uh, but Chinese government is attempting to, you know, undermine him. Uh, and in fact, His Holiness Dalai Lama for at least last over 30 years has been like proposing like, you know, the middle way approach, uh, telling Chinese government that Tibetans can live with the genuine autonomy, but his request has been denied and furthermore like, you know, attack him and try to, you know, uh, criticize, uh, which has not helped uh, the, on the issue of Tibet. And Chinese government is completely uh, blame on the, all, the, all, the, all the incidents that's uh, because of their own uh, actions. Uh, but I must remind you that as we are discussing about the Confucius Institute here, I think Confucius Institute is just a tip of the iceberg. There are so many things happening. And Tibetans have the most experience uh, dealing with China and the Chinese Communist regime. Uh, because of the occupation, over 1.2 Tibetan million people died. And when you see Tibetan people here, there are people whose immediate family member passed away and even right now facing these challenges. And what we see right now, the concern in terms of the democracy, the issue that we are facing here uh, what Xi Jinping is trying to take the advantage of the situation, and I, because I'm not an expert, I'm an activist, I meet a lot of people at the forefront, like, you know, grassroots people, uh, activists from Taiwan, from South Asian countries, even like smaller countries whose democracies are in like struggle right now, and what Xi Jinping is trying to sell is the Chinese system is working, one party system is working, mm -hmm. and that is something we need to be really careful uh, and that really challenged the, 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 the free society that we are practicing here. And Xi Jinping recently uh, changed the constitution and now tag him as himself as the, the, the leader of China as an emperor forever. And there was a time that uh, 20, 30 years back when the Western democracy countries trying to deal with China and we have been telling them, it is not a new thing for Tibetans <laughs> We have been telling that over and over years, like you have to be careful because we cannot trade our freedom and principle with, like, you know, with, with the economy and the benefit with China. Uh, but nobody listened. But now what we are seeing is people are seeing the things. And after dealing with China, after opening with the Chinese communist regime, things have gone from bad to worse. So we have to think about that. Our society, free society, is under threat. It is not about the issue only about the Tibetans or the Taiwanese or like, you know, the Chinese people inside. It's our future, future of the international community who wanted to be respected in human rights and free society. So I think we have to be really uh, careful. And the Confucius Institute is just a small, like, you know, uh, sign that we are seeing and they're much more, uh, and especially when the corporations are being traded with China, when Google tried to enter in China with a search engine, special search engine for CCP, uh, we, have to be think we have to be careful on that. 
Uh, because of that, there are people concerned, even Google employees are concerned, so corporation, everyone. So I think people who believe in democracy and human rights, we should stand together and, uh, and, and of course, like people here in, uh, in, in, in Portland and Oregon, like, you know, PSU is something that uh, is concerning and uh, community here are, uh, are, are haven't given our whole hope, like, you know, Tibetans for over the last 60 years, no matter how difficult situation, we will never give up our hope for freedom and justice. And uh, the community of coalition needs your support. Uh, so with that, I want to, you know, end, and I hope like you will continue our, uh, you know, cause together. Thank you so much. Yes. I know that was very, I don't want to, I shouldn't say anything because that was very inspiring, but I do want to add that it's, in, that it's academic freedom with the Confucius Institute, and I completely agree that things have gone from bad to worse. It used to be in China that there was a sense that opening up eventually and democracy was better, but that's not even the narrative anymore at all. And I have real concerns about whether you can have academic freedom in a one-party state. So this is a fight for democracy, I agree. <laughs>